shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Shishmita Kaushik, who is a professor from the Department of Ophthalmology, PGI Chandigarh, and again, an amazing surgeon with a unlimited the knowledge on glaucoma. So let's learn from her. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, for having me on this amazing uh, webinar. Lots, lots to learn. Thank you. So um, going on to those uh, children who've had pediatric cataract surgery, and then uh, land up with us for glaucoma. So I like this quote a lot. There are no seven wonders of the world in the eyes of the child. There are seven million. So the children, for them, really, the world is there for them to see. And if we don't catch them early uh, in, in time, then we may be in trouble. So uh, the, the caveats for glaucoma following pediatric cataract surgery, I feel, is to anticipate or suspect unfortunately they come to us way too late so anticipate and suspect and then diagnose and then treat i think that's the caveat that we would use so who do you anticipate and suspect it? the high risk ones are the children with smaller eyes less than 16.5 millimeters at birth if the age of surgery is less than six months if you're doing bilateral surgery simultaneously for some reason, the use of tripe and glue, I mean, that was interesting when I went through the literature. Reinterventions make sense. And I will, of course, because you're putting so much of hardware into a small eye. Um, coexisting cataract and glaucoma is uncommon, but I'd like to say that it's not uh, impossible. So these are uh, diseases to keep in mind, especially for our setting coexisting rubella because infection is important and Lewy syndrome is known but it's not particularly common. So once it happens there should be no complacency it's not going to go away. So for in the instance in this kid if you thought that this cornea was equal to this cornea it's not going to happen. So iatrogenic glaucoma something that we've given the kid and the child didn't have it to start with and remember once we've given it to the child that baby or that uh, that kid has to deal with it for the rest of his life. So in a nutshell, the management could be medical or surgery. Of course, we start with medical management. But unfortunately, if it's not looked for, by the time the children come to us, it's, it's quite a bit uh, advanced. Surgery always depends on intraocular pressure and disc damage. You would like to do angle surgery first because secondary glaucomas tend to do all right. I think because the outflow channels are okay to begin with and it's a trabecular meshwork problem. But having said that, trabeculectomy, glaucoma drainage devices and even a limited diode laser cyclophotocoagulation, maybe you could include an ECP if you have your machine there into that. So these are the angle surgeries that we have, a coniotomy, a bang or a gat. Always be alert. For instance, this father was a faking. And the minute he had the baby daughter, he took it to the ophthalmologist. She was detected early, infantile surgery done at six months, but then presented to us at eight years of age. So we have no idea what has happened between six months and eight years. She comes to us pseudo faking, uh, the right eye PCO, left eye, obviously gophthalmos. You can see the larger eye in the left. IOP was 17 and 28 millimeters of mercury. So remember in small children, the eye may just enlarge in response to pressures without there being appreciably steamy cornea or any other signs. And this is what the discs were like. So through the PCO, we could see the right eye hazily, but you can see that the left eye already for this child has had quite a bit of damage. So that's what I meant that by the time they come to us, they are already quite late. So we decided on angle surgery because it was a reasonable cornea. We thought the trabecular meshwork were dysfunctional. And though there was peripheral anterior sinea we decided on the least invasive route first. So remember these children, like Dr. Murli said, have to live long. And as far as possible, if we could avoid opening the conjunctiva, I'd be happy. So you can see these bits of PA is there, but otherwise the, the TM through the hazy cornea, slightly hazy cornea was reasonable. So with surgery, we tried GAT, but uh, you you can see this is the peripheral anterior sinica and that since this, this is the nasal angle that's being seen. Um, so there is PAS there, but we managed with the with the small goniotomy 
Um, we don't have the eye track at least commercially available in India, so we do use a fibro proline to do a, a GAT. And the idea is to treat as much of the trabecular meshwork as possible in one time. So that was the idea that we'll take it as it comes. And uh, as we kept advancing it, you saw the suture, we saw that it getting stuck. So we decided to, you know, uh, remove the lens and just do a hemi gat or do as much of the TM as possible. And the next thing we thought was, let's treat the rest of the angle with a bang. So this is just a 25 gauge needle that we use. You bend the tip of it and the rest of the angle. So even if you can't do a full gat, at least do as much as possible and the rest of the angle as much as possible. So you rather than do just about 120 degrees with the goniotomy, you can manage almost 270 degrees in most of these eyes and cheat it very well with this. Um, when we're coming to a glaucoma drainage device, so this was a child who was pseudo fake had quite a bit of glaucoma, had a couple of surgeries. So this is easy. We usually implant into the sulcus. I'm, I'm running both videos together. So this is the tube which will go straight. So the idea is keeping a slightly longer tube so that you can see the tube post-operatively. And uh, once you can see it post-operatively, that's important. So you just put that there and here you see the tube just under the iris. So it's easy to monitor. So uh, it's an easy thing to do when the child is uh, pseudo faking. And here you can see this is the ridge of the uh, non valve drainage device. We have the oral lab drainage device here with, of course, a tight suture. So this was one of the things when we were talking about what do we do with the blebs. Um, this is one way to monitor when the ligata is going to be released. And we are very careful in removing AGMs at that time when this border starts to get fuzzy. So that's just one small tip in whenever we put a drainage device. So sometimes uh, these children are a faking and uh, you choose the parts planar and you think the child is vitrectomized and you just just do that. So this, this we learned the hard way. Uh, first post-op day and you can see all these vitreous strands going into it. So we made the mistake of thinking that it's a vitrectomized child and we didn't do a skirt vitrectomy before implanting it in the parts planar. So we had to take it up. This is the very next day. You can see the sutures there. And as we did the vitrectomy, we realized how silly we were. And this is the inferior nasal tube. And you can see how much of vitreous there was. So it takes time, but take your time and do as much of vitrectomy and do as much of the anterior vitrectomy. So even if you have a vitrectomized eye, a post, uh, post uh, PPVI, remember the skirt vitrectomy needs to be done by us. And these are the pictures after that. You can see how clear the tube is. And now that's how the pressure was controlled. So it's important to see why the pressure is rising and what to do with it. Now, often these children have had multiple surgeries. This is someone with a congenital, uh, sorry, a traumatic cataract, who had multiple surgeries, had a PPD for an RD as well, and then came to us with very high pressures. Sometimes you have syndromic children who you know are not going to show you, and you think that it's better to be non-invasive. The ciliary body area is distorted. The vision is not too great. So it may be one reason for the unpredictable of DNCP. So what we started doing is use a simple pen torch to delineate the ciliary body. And this is a short video to just show how it's done. Um, so the microscope lights are switched off. Usually the microscope isn't used, but this is the small pen torch and you can see how far back the ciliary uh, body actually is. So the limbus is really distorted. And one reason why we see the, the results are so unpredictable is I think maybe sometimes we don't even treat the ciliary body, we're treating too anteriorly. And uh, we use a sterile gentian violet marker to mark out the area which has been shown. We usually leave the supinonasal area untreated all the time. So that has uh, helped provide. So you can see where the ciliary body starts. And then we do the DLCP by putting the anterior plate where we have marked it rather than at the limbus. And this has given us much more predictable results, especially in children and those with very, very distorted limbus system. This is one small, inexpensive hack that we've had, and we're happy with that. So in a nutshell, glaucoma after pediatric surgery may compromise an otherwise excellent outcome. So intraocular pressure measurement is mandatory after a cataract surgery. And look out for intraocular pressure Excellent growth. That has helped very much, especially in children up to three years of age and the disc appearance because the IOP may be fallacious. 
Early ocular hypertension must be promptly treated medically before the disc becomes damaged. But once there's disc damage or there's bophthalmos, we've realized that usually they require surgery. And I'd like to thank all my team and my residents who work painstakingly hard every day. Thank you very much for having me. That was an amazing talk. Fantastic, Doctor. Uh, Murli, would you have any question? Do we have our last speaker, Dr. Venkatesh, with us? No? Oh, he's there. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Venkatesh. Murli, would you take a question or shall we go on to Dr. Uh, yeah, madam. It is said, uh, madam, that uh, glaucoma is usually bimodal in onset in these uh, children. Uh, like in the initial first year after surgery, they have an angiflosure uh, disease and later on, whatever glaucoma develops, it is uh, uh, an open angle. The second peak at five years. So is that correct, madam? How often do you see that bimodal onset in your practice? So usually, at least nowadays with the microsurgical techniques and uh, fantastic cataract surgeons that are there, early post-op IOP is less commonly seen. But just because the pressures are okay for the first year or two is not a reason to forget about these children. And that's why they come to us late, eight years, nine years later, when already this damage is done. And I think this amount of creeping angle closure does play a role which comes on later. So like congenital glaucoma, I think congenital cataract, the children must be told that this is a lifelong disease and you'll never be rid of us. So even twice a year, pressure recordings and everything else, as along with the visual rehabilitation, amplifier, they do keep coming. But sadly, the intraocular pressure measurement does get forgotten in, in all that. So I, I would say that. Yes. Thank you very much.